I'm very pleased to welcome everybody to the annual visiting committee meeting today. Thank you all for being here and thank you so much for your critical involvement as presidential visiting committee members and Dana-Farber supporters. Um, as I mentioned to you uh, last night, um, it's really truly an honor to preside over this meeting for the second time. Last year, of course, I was brand new and was just getting settled in. And uh, over the last year, I've become, I hope, fully integrated into this amazing institution. And I now have a year's worth of insight uh, into this, this incredible place. And as we continue to plan for the future of Dana-Farber over the next five years, uh, it's very important for me to hear from all of our loyal supporters who are truly passionate about our mission because you have important things to say to me in collecting your thoughts over the course of today. Your ideas, your feedback is going to be important to me as we continue to move forward and leverage the wonderful talent uh, that we have at Dana-Farber. You've been wonderful ambassadors to the Dana-Farber community. You, you broaden our networks. Uh, you are helping us secure resources so that we can continue to do the work that we care so much about as physicians and scientists and stay on the cutting edge of research and care. So these committees really are very, very important to me. I'm going to be wandering through them during the morning, uh, trying to catch at least a few minutes of each one. So I, I really really appreciate your, your help here. So the theme of this year's uh, symposium, as you know, is drug development from discovery to delivery. And we're going to discuss our progress in uh, developing new treatments, as well as very exciting opportunities within our chemical biology program and our translational research program and novel strategies and partnerships with industry. We've made tremendous progress over the last year. I'm going to just highlight a few things. We need to today also be talking about what we need to continue to do the great work that we're doing. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit to our plans to grow the clinical enterprise and also review where we see opportunities for expanding our research leadership position. So the Dana-Farber is known really for three things. We have this very unique balance between research and clinical care that you won't see at any other cancer institute, where we have roughly the same number of brilliant researchers that we do wonderful caring clinicians. This, of course, is expensive because research is very expensive, and the costs of research are increasing faster than the costs of funding and the resources for funding. But this is, our, th this is the core of Dana-Farber. And uh, this is something that we are going to strive to continue to support. So here are some highlights from our research enterprise. Um, this year, we recruited a whole slew of brilliant young research faculty across many of the important disciplines that we study, cancer genomics, immunotherapy, epigenetics, we have more outstanding investigator awards from the National Cancer Institute than any other cancer center does, despite the fact that we're actually a little bit smaller than most cancer centers. We have continued to produce amazing new discoveries that have been published in top-notch journals. And impressively, if you look at the number of drugs that have been approved by the FDA over the last six years, Almost half of all of the 75 new drugs approved have Dana-Farber fingerprints all over them. And Dana-Farber was chosen as one of the first sites to deliver this amazing new therapy called CAR T-cell therapy. Here's an example of the kind of research we're doing. This is one of our faculty members, Dr. Catherine Wu, who has produced the first cancer vaccine that has been shown to be effective, albeit in preliminary trials. And this is a vaccine against melanoma. She treated six patients with this vaccine. These patients had stage four metastatic melanoma. Four of the patients responded to the vaccine and have no evidence of further disease 
further growth of their tumors. Two of the patients relapsed and then were put on immunotherapy, which previously had not worked for them, and responded and are currently seeing no tumor, further tumor growth. So this is the beginning, really, of the very exciting field of cancer vaccines. And here's another example. This is a pediatric patient who had a tumor surrounding her hip and pelvis. She was put on a clinical trial with a drug that was designed specifically for the mutation, the translocation that she had. Pediatric cancer patients have different kinds of mutations than adult patients. And you can see that her tumor has stabilized over the next six months by being on this new drug, new clinical trial. And finally, another example, and this comes from work from Dr. Scott Armstrong, the chair of our Department of Pediatric Oncology in a new field called epigenetics, which we are very strong in at Dana-Farber. And here is a, a woman who has leukemia that spread to her skin. And thanks to a drug that Dr. Armstrong developed in collaboration with the company Epizyme, this woman's leukemia is now no longer visible on her skin. So these are the kinds of things that we can do, but of course it takes a lot of resources to do them. We've also continued to expand our clinical enterprise. We've in increased our new patient volume. We have had increased revenue from the four satellites that we have around New England. We continue to recruit brilliant new clinical faculty, including wonderful new positions in nursing, and we maintained our magnet status for the third time since 2005. And this is a status that reflects the quality of our nursing care is only given to about 5% of hospitals. We've also increased the number of our international and national patients. And I think reflecting these advances, uh, Becker deemed us one of the top 100 hospitals in America. And this is not one of the top cancer hospitals, but all hospitals. We've retained our ranking. We are the only cancer institute that ranks in the top fourth in both pediatric and adult oncology. So this is a wonderful balance. It works, worked really beautifully for us. We're making, I think, incredible strides towards reducing the cancer burden but we have to understand that still, two out of every five Americans will develop cancer during their lifetime. And while we've made amazing advances in some cancers, there's a lot left to do. Many challenges that we need to overcome. And so we've been thinking very strategically about the future of Dana-Farber and how we can continue to achieve this balance, this unique balance that has worked so well for us. And that means we need to raise more resources for both clinical care and for our research. And there are several ways of doing that, and I think we've made big progress on all of them, and we need to continue to enlarge these sources, key sources of supports for expanding our research and clinical care. Philanthropy, of course, is always an enormous player on this list, and we're very, very grateful to all of our supporters for their passionate commitment to our mission at Dana-Farber. And this is particularly important given the pervasive uncertainty about the role of our federal government in providing support. Dana-Farber researchers do very well in garnering NIH support, but NIH support is very insufficient. It has actually declined by 25% over the last decade, and I don't see much hope of it expanding over the next few years. So we rely on people like you to help us ga gather the funds that we can um, utilize. We've started a new venture. It's a, a unique venture philanthropy structure. Uh, I think there's something about it in your, in your booklets. But this is a combination of investment and philanthropy. It's very unique, probably the first of its kind. And we're very excited about it. And it's based on the fact that Dana-Farber has spun off in the last decade over 30 companies, of which 28 are still alive and kicking. Some of them have been sold. Some have been monetized. But we have a very, very vigorous pipeline through our uh, chemical biology group of uh, new drugs, uh, new molecules to help our patients. So this is a very interesting opportunity and reflects the kind of innovative approaches we're taking to garnering more resources that will help us continue our mission. 
And to that end, we recruited a, a wonderful senior vice president of in innovation, Leslie Solomon. And um, she is continuing. She has many, many exciting ideas. We're working together about how we can increase our research revenue in unique and innovative ways. One effort that we've made, and we want to bring the quality of Dana-Farber cancer clinical care to the communities. We have four satellites, but we know that our wonderful Yaki building is nearing capacity now, and by 2020 will be full. And so what we have done is to lease two floors in, an, in, in what used to be the atrium, uh, at Chestnut Hill, and this is going to allow us to expand our patient volume and to provide easier access uh, to those patients who live in that part of uh, Boston suburbs. We're going to add another satellite to our four satellites in Foxborough, and we have established many collaborative partnerships which will enable us to bring clinical trials to patients outside of the Boston area, because we believe that for Patients who have no acceptable standard of care for their cancer, they should be offered the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. And if you look at local uh, oncology care, only 3% of patients are on clinical trials compared to about 20% if you come into the Longwood Medical Area. And so we want to extend our reach and offer that possibility to all cancer patients here in Massachusetts and in New England. We'd also like to grow our international patient volume, and we have doubled it this year, and we'll continue to try to do that. Dana-Farber has a wonderful story to tell, and I think everybody in New England and the Northeast knows Dana-Farber as the number one hospital in this part of the country. I think that our brand um, is not as well known in other parts of the United States and abroad, and so we are going to begin telling that story, and, and to that end, we hired a wonderful chief marketing officer, David Feinberg, and I think you'll see some of the um, ads that he is preparing coming out fairly soon. So we believe Dana-Farber is the right place. It is the best place to crack the code of so many cancers that we still are not able to treat. We've made great strides at some cancers, but there are cancers that are quite intransigent. And we think that at Dana-Farber, we have the talented faculty we have the talented clinicians that make us the place that needs to take on the tough challenges, the tough cancers. And that's what we're going to do over the next five years. And here are some of the ways that we're going to do that. We're going to have more first-in-human clinical trials from the drugs that we make in-house. We're going to continue this wonderful drug discovery that we are so uniquely equipped to carry out. And of course, continue our transformative breakthroughs in the laboratory. On the clinical front, we continue to offer innovative treatments to our patients. We have the wonderful specialized services which are going to offer not only to the patients at Longwood Medical Area, but throughout New England. And we, as you know, continue to achieve superior outcomes. So it takes a village. I am just so lucky to be at the helm of an institution where everybody, from our parking attendants to our physicians, our nurses, are A-plus people. I've never been in an institution where everybody seems to be an A-plus. So thank you very much. And I now am happy to introduce Dr. Barrett Rollins, who's going to moderate the talks today. Barrett, as you know, is Dana-Farber's chief scientific officer and the Lindy Family Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He does a great job. So please help me welcome Barrett to the stage. <laughs> 